Thank God, he says. You made it. Seeing Simon in the flesh, albeit virtual flesh, is surreal. He wears the light blue dress shirt and dark trousers that come as the standard clothing for a male avatar. His hair is the generic brown crew cut, and even his facial features seem unchanged from the default setting. The only thing that sets Simon aside from the corporate factory model is a big bushy mustache covering his lips. He looks like a Wild West sheriff who gave it all up to work a desk job. Just need to inject your original avatar with the virus and you should be well on your way. Simon's voice sounds significantly more human when it comes out of the mouth of the digital puppets than it did booming in my skull. Let's get you out of here, shall we? He asks, as he extends his cartoon hand to me. I grab it and climb up to my feet. We're in a meeting room just a couple doors down from my workstation. For months, the halls of the virtual office seemed grossly artificial, like technology that still needed at least a decade in the oven. But after the time I have spent shackled to the metaverse, they seem more real than my distant living room. Lying in my office, dressed in clean clothes and wearing healthy looking skin, I see another cartoon version of myself. He looks like an abandoned corpse that hasn't started to rot yet. Any word from corporate? I ask, my voice raw from all the screaming. They're aware of the problem, he says. But they aren't going to do anything about it. They quarantine the office to make sure the code doesn't spread, and that seems like the start and end of how they're going to deal with this Eggman situation. An employee trapped in the simulation for almost a week and they won't do anything? You're not an employee anymore, Simon says, motioning to the lifeless cartoon man on the floor. For what it's worth, I'm not an employee anymore either. About a day after the quarantine, they fired the entire pod. Company is getting restructured, apparently. Severance bonuses are pretty good if you sign an NDA, though. So we're breaking and entering right now? I ask. Theoretically, I guess. I don't see his lips move. But the bushy mustache lifts into what I presume is a smile. You still got the syringe? I pull out the hypodermic out of my coat and lend the weak neon glow to the bland office space. Good. Simon's mustache lifts into a smile once more. You want to do the honors? Far too many questions about metaphysical anatomy rush through my brain at once. The cartoon clone lying on the floor makes the syringe in my hands tremble. Good. You do it? I ask. Pulp fiction, eat your heart out. Simon whispers beneath his mustache, and then, with great force, he rams the shining syringe into the cartoon man's chest. The eyes of my virtual avatar spring open. The rest of his body stays completely still, but he stares directly at me. The wild expression on the man's face reminds me of a deer I once met on a highway. And now, we wait. Simon taps the side of the syringe. A percentage sign starts to tick down as the neon liquid disappears. Shouldn't be more than a couple minutes. I get up and walk across the crammed office, hoping that I'll be able to escape the cartoon man's gaze, but he keeps his eyes locked on me. How are your kids? I ask, hoping for distraction and conversation. Huh? Your kids, I say. You said you were reading them bedtime stories when this all started? His mustache drops. Look, uh, I don't have any kids. Oh, I say. You messaged me on the company app. It was after hours. My response after hours is always that I'm doing something with my kids so people leave me alone and don't expect me to do work I'm not paid for. I hope you understand. Lucky you checked your message later, I say, wondering whether anything would have changed in that hour without communication. Yeah, the moment I listened to the message, I got online. Sorry it took so long, it's just... I hate this place. They squeeze you for every cent you're worth and then expect you to show team spirit about it. Wouldn't lie about having kids if I wasn't constantly getting dragged into the office without getting paid for it. I hate this place. Wouldn't come to work with this if I didn't. Simon gestures to the mustache and laughs. <laughs> Seriously though, screw these people. Amen, I say. Simon checks the syringe. It's sitting at 65%. With a sigh, he makes his way from the cartoon man through the window. 
Outside sits a poorly rendered cityscape stuck in perpetual golden hour. They do pay a mean severance package, though, he says. How much? I ask. He tells me. Oh, I say, and join him at the window. The further the streets stretch, the more pixelated they become. I gaze at the blocky horizon, but the low polygon buildings become nothing but a flickering backdrop to a realization. That abstract idea that I am a man of flesh standing in a living room crawls up my spine and hardens into a concrete truth. I can no longer feel the difference between my skin and the virtual reality gloves, but with a bit of focus I can feel the weight of the headset on my head. There's soft carpet beneath my feet and freedom is within grasp. Halfway there, Simon says. The syringe is half empty and a dead-eyed avatar is still looking at me. Thank you. I say, averting my eyes from the death stare of my twin. If it wasn't for you, I would have been torn apart by the Egghead's minions, or I would have met my end at the supermarket, or with the Sphinx, or in some other horrible way. When all this is over, I owe you a drink. I'll happily take you up on that offer, he says, his cartoon mustache raising into a smile. Actually, before comms cut out, you mentioned the riddle? Yeah. I crawl, I crawl upon the iron, I know no other than my mates, I crawl, I crawl until I reach my hole. Great grandfather used to repeat it all the time. That one, what's the answer? The mustache raises once more. How about I tell you when we grab drinks? Deal, I say. The syringe sits at 33% and the green hue is dying down. I start planning my life in a flesh and bone world, but before those plans get too detailed, an eerie dread seeps into my mind. At first, it's impossible to place. I simply feel an absolute certainty that something is going to go wrong. Soon enough though, my gut gets a visual confirmation. Eyes of burning coal. Off in a distance, at first few but quickly multiplying, moves a gathering of familiar monstrosities. The Egghead's minions wobble through the muddy geometry with utter determination and in discomforting numbers. The landscape which they move over is vague, but their direction is clear. He's here, I say. Simon looks out of the window and regards the steadily advancing wave of the burnt creatures. The Eggman? Don't ever call him that. It's Professor Egghead. He's extremely particular about his... There's a crash in the hallway. It's followed by the shuffling of a hundred small feet. Okay, Simon says, shutting the door. We're at what, 22%? I'll just distract him till the timer runs out. It's darker outside than it should be. Instead of the programmed golden hour, the sun is bleeding on the horizon. The sea of red coals has spread out beyond the blocky parking lot of the office. There's a hard slam on the door, followed by a staccato of tiny harsh knocks. As if response, Simon's arms fly out to his sides and his eyes roll back in his skull. For a moment, he just stands there, crucified, and I lose all hope of rescue. The flame of hope only goes out for a second though. Just checking, he says, his mustache lifting into a smile once more. Want to make sure I can still take this thing off. Don't worry, we're getting you out of here. There's another slam on the door, this time a part of the wood gives. A dozen gray hands claw through the hole. I reach up for my head, hoping that perhaps my luck has changed but my wrists go limp once more. Before I regain any feeling in my fingers, the door comes crashing down. They pour in like a flood of nightmares. The terrible burnt creatures rush in, babbling and snapping their sharp-toothed jaws. It's only after his minions crowd most of the room that he enters, wobbling over their bodies, eliciting tiny grunts with each rotation of his egg-shaped mass, enters Professor Egghead and his mallet. The syringe sits at 18%. For far too long I have been kept from my laboratory. For far too long I have been deprived of the sweet embrace of science, but no more. Now my journey through this series of virtual pipes has come to an end. Daghead's eyes look exhausted, but there's a terrible energy in the way he beats the mallet against his palm. You will learn a very important lesson in physics. When you betray the egghead, the 
mallet comes down! Professor Egghead? Simon's voice tears the nightmare's attention away. Is that you? Oh my, I have heard so much about you. The nightmare's eyes close in pleasure at the mention of his name. The professor smiles and jiggles his body as if he'd been tickled. I am not surprised. Everyone has heard about the professor. The syringe sits at 15%. Yes, Professor Egghead, I have heard a lot about you. I've heard you're smart and a hard worker and an absolute expert in the field of science. Simon's mustache hops up high enough for his teeth to show. May I ask a question, Professor Egghead? I have urgent business to attend to. Every second I spend away from my laboratory is a direct assault on the future of man. Deghead slams his mallet against his palm once more and gestures towards me. His minions hiss and snap in my ankles. But... Deghead says, closing his eyes and wiggling around once more. When given the proper respect, I am willing to indulge an inquisitive mind. What would you like to know, my mustache friend? The syringe sits at 12%. I'm sure your immense knowledge stretches across all possible disciplines, but I wonder, Professor Egghead, what is your favorite kind of science? Egghead's yellow eyes blow it up in shock. Ooh. He wheezes without any emotion. Slobber gathers among his massive lips. In a terrible mixture of humor and pain, the creature sings. Ooh. You ignorant little mustache man! You sing my praises, but you do not understand my deeds! I hear a crunch, followed by a thousand taps of glass. The window behind me has broken out into a spiderweb of cracks. Outside, a sea of gray flesh and burning coals presses against the glass. Daghead's minions have us surrounded. My love of science is not one of adoration of favor! My love of science is one of necessity. If I do not love the science, if I do not wholeheartedly commit my existence to the science, all shall perish. My marriage to the realm of data and research is a sadistic one, but I endure. I endure for the good of man. Oh, Simon says. He's clearly made uneasy by the frothing nightmare, but he still manages to twitch his mustache into a weak smile. Well, Professor Egghead, you have my utmost apologies and gratitude for... Enough apologies! Isaac Newton would rub chlorine in his eyes to possess even a fraction of the knowledge that sits in my mighty brain. I will waste no more of my valuable time... Talking to a simpleton of your stature? Do not say another word to me. I have urgent business to attend to. Beghead turns around on his heels to face me. His spin crushes one of his minions beneath his feet, but the sea of burning coals quickly absorbs the death. You. Professor Egghead screams, raising his mallet high above his head. Now it is time for me to deal with you. The syringe sits at 8%. My terrified eyes meet Simon's. Professor Egghead, my friend screams. I didn't mean to offend you. I'm a big fan of... No! No, no! The egg-shaped creature screeches as it crushes another one of its minions in a furious spin. Were you raised in a barn? Were you not taught to hold your tongue when a bright mind has business to attend to? With his free hand, the professor grips the top of Simon's head. Is the mustache drawing blood from your frontal cortex? Can you not comprehend? I do not wish to communicate with you. Simon's mustache shifts as if he was about to say something, but then his jaw drops and his eyes grow wide. No words come only screams. Like a man caught on an electric fence, Simon spasms beneath the egghead's stubby fingers. In a panicked effort to help my friend, I pick up one of the coal-eyed monstrosities and throw it at the professor. 
The oval creature is heavy, and its body burns my already maligned fingers, yet the egghead doesn't register the impact. He continues shaking Simon by the skull. I demand to be left alone! The egg-shaped scientist screams. I demand peace and quiet and death to all traitors so I can return to my scientific duties! Can your mustache brain not comprehend that? The web of shattered glass on the windows grows more complex. All of the outside world is now eaten up by innumerable oval bodies. They're all tapping and biting and looking at me. For a brief moment, in a fleeting glimpse, I see an inkling of human flesh in the sea of grey, but it quickly disappears. A dozen minions crack beneath the weights of Simon's limp body. For a moment, he lies next to my dead-eyed avatar, looking equally lifeless, but then he blinks. With utter terror, Simon climbs to his feet. He reaches for his head, but his wrists go limp. What did you do to me? Oh god, w what did you do to me? I said I will not be answering any further questions! Deghead screams, gripping his mallet. Now leave me be! I have other business to attend to! With discomforting swiftness, Deghead swings his mallet at Simon. It's a direct hit to the skull. With a crack of the spine, Simon's cartoon head severs from his torso. The blood that springs out of his neck hisses against the coal eyes of the Egghead's minions. I can smell the blood. Now, where were we? The Egghead sighs. Ah yes, your execution. The syringe sits at 5%. He turns to me and slams the mallet against his stubby hand. You stand accused of treason against the egghead? You gazed upon my most prized experiment and then you fled the scene to tell the world? You have not only broken my heart, but you have also stolen my secrets. Now it is time for your brain to be emptied of what you have witnessed. Wait, I yell, cowering. Please, Professor Egghead, I've already completely forgotten what I saw in your laboratory. Just please let me go home. I won't tell anyone about what happened here. My eyes are shut, expecting death, yet death never comes. Instead, Egghead stands above me confused, mallet by his side. You have forgotten the being of corrupted flesh that you saw in my laboratory? You have simply forgotten? Memories of strands of poorly rendered flesh scrape across the recesses of my mind, but I still nod my head. The syringe clocks over from 4% to 3%. I promise I will never tell anyone, I whisper. You are a man of sturdy mind then. A fool perhaps, but a fool who can witness the unspeakable and walk away. Mm. Even a chimpanzee can be taught to operate a car. Yes. That is it! I, Professor Egghead, Bishop of Education, have changed my mind! Your brain will not be malletized! The nightmare's eyes close, as if he were being tickled again. Like a child on a sugar high, the Egghead starts to stomp with excitement. Instead, you will become an assistant in my laboratory! The syringe clocks down from 3% to 2%. Outside, in a sea of grey flesh and burning coals, I see another hint of cartoon flesh. A hand with smooth, nailless fingers presses up against the cracking glass. It quickly disappears beneath the weight of the Egghead's minions. Do you agree to become my lovely wedded scientific partner? Will you suffer with me under the weight of incomprehensible knowledge for all eternity? Or would you rather follow the fates of your mustached associate? I can feel the soft carpet beneath my feet. Freedom is just a couple percentage points away. Yes, Professor Egghead, I say. I will be your lab assistant. Please, just don't kill me. Splendid! He screams. And then, just as 2% turns to 1%, he rips the syringe out of my avatar. My cartoon twin's eyes close, and my heart sinks. It would be a tragedy if you were ripped from this world just as we came to an agreement, wouldn't it? Outside, for just a moment, 
I see a familiar dead-eyed smile in the sea of grey. Wouldn't it be a tragedy? It would, I say. Daghead wobbles his body in approval and looks at the syringe. There's but a single drop of neon green inside of it. It slides across the barrel like a tear. He shakes his head, as if the syringe were a disappointment to him. Enough time has been wasted. He screams. The hours which I spent on the Saini adventure have been hours which I could have spent in the lab with beakers and charts. I have done a disservice to mankind, but I have found a pair of helping hands, and these helping hands will be here forever. Beyond the spiderweb of cracks, there is a sea of gray flesh and burning eyes. I don't see her anymore. I don't see her, but I pray that she is somewhere among the professor's minions, ready to help an old customer in need. Professor Egghead wobbles closer. The sulfur on his breath makes my eyes water. No one escapes the company of Professor Egghead! Isn't that right? My spit tastes of iron. I open my mouth to speak, and for a moment all I want to do is reaffirm the Egghead's ideas and stay away from any conflict, but I know where that path leads. I know that if I leave with the Egghead I will never see my home again. I open my mouth and scream, Sally, help! The window behind me shatters, filling my matted hair with crystals of glass. The misshapen virtual world assistant hits the Egghead in a mighty swan dive and sends him flying across the room. My eyes burn with bright neon letters. Our shop assistant is currently busy with another customer. Please wait. What is this madness? Who dares to assault the king of knowledge? The, the customer, customer is always right, right and, and the, the customer, customer cannot, cannot be, be made uncomfortable. uncomfortable. Sally screams in her cheery voice. Our, Our store, store has, has a zero tolerance violence policy. The afterglow of the burning letters still blinds me, but I can hear the melee ahead. Sally is not just fighting the Egghead, but his minions as well. In a blind frenzy, I searched the floor hoping that the Egghead dropped the syringe. He did. As Sally fights for my freedom, I grip the syringe and feel out the chest of my digital avatar. I stab blindly, but I strike true. The syringe plunges straight into the digital avatar's chest and for a moment, beneath the fading green letters, I lock eyes with my digital twin. His mouth opens. The syringe clocks down from 1% to 0%. He screams. An indefinable rush of energy twists my body. It's like being caught in a muddy wave of silt and electricity or tumbling down the stairs. My body is shaken and spun and jerked from side to side. As strong as the tornado of motion is, I manage to raise my hands and grip the headset attached to my skull. I grip the machine. My wrists and fingers hold on strong, yet the white crown refuses to leave my skull. The headset is fused to my skin. The headset is fused to my skin, but I know that it's too late to turn back now. I pull, I pull as hard as I can and my flesh breaks and my eyes drown in blood. Through sheer agony, the snare leaves me. Instantly, the world turns still. Soft carpet. I re-emerge into reality clutching the strands of my soft living room carpet. I am no longer a hobbled cartoon creature. I am a man of flesh and bone and blood. The primal joy of freedom soars out of my throat, but my cries of victory are brief. I am out of the simulation. I am a man of flesh and bone. I am in my living room. My wildest dreams have been fulfilled, yet something is wrong. I am not alone.